Welcome to today's webinar presented by the United States Capitol Historical Society, the congressionally chartered nonprofit charged with telling the story of the Capitol and those who work here in a manner that inspires informed patriotism. Sam Holliday, our Director of Operations and Scholarship, will be monitoring the chat if you have any technical questions. So please deal with technical issues on the chat. Once Dr. Hayes finishes his presentation, he will take questions that have been put into the Q&A uh, section. So please put your questions as you think of them in the Q&A, and I will pose them to our speaker. Today, in 1945, on this date, the Auschwitz-Birkenbach concentration camp was liberated. And since 2005, the United Nations designated January 27th as International Holocaust Remor Memorial Day. The genocide of 6 million Jewish people and the murder of millions of others was the greatest crime ever committed in world history, one has which, which has left as many questions as it has answers. For instance, what could our leaders have done to help its victims? What was the debate in Congress? Was there even a debate? In 1938, the world was shocked to learn of Germany's Kristallnacht, the mass murder, beating, and arrest of Jewish people and destruction of their property. One year later, a ship carrying about 900 Jewish refugees was turned away at a U.S. port. President Roosevelt chose not to intercede on the passengers' behalf. Neither did the Prime Minister of Canada. After the ship's refugees were forced to return to Europe, hundreds died in the Holocaust. Many American newspapers reported on the violence against the Jewish people, but somehow other challenges came before confronting this issue. Today, as our commitment to never forget, we present Northwestern Professor Emeritus, Dr. Peter Hayes, the former chair of the Academic Committee of the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum, to discuss his book, Why? Explaining the Holocaust. Professor Hayes. Thank you very much, Jane. Um, good morning, everyone, or in, in my case, it's good morning because I'm talking to you from Chicago, but in your case, it is probably uh, the afternoon. I'm trying to, I'm not getting, uh-oh. Why am I not getting, there we go. Start again. In my case, it's, it's uh, morning, but in your case, it's probably afternoon. 80 years ago last month, the first mass gassings of Jews in what we call the Holocaust occurred in a little village in Poland called Chelmno. All these years later, many people find it almost impossible to understand how this could occur, let alone in Europe, an area that we tend to regard as the center of the civilized world. I wrote a book a few years ago attempting to help people answer the central questions about the subject that they had. Why the Germans were the people who perpetrated this massacre, why the Jews were the principal target of it, and so on and so forth. We don't have time today to go through all of those questions, and so what I want to do is address two central questions that are pertinent to us today in the United States. The first question has to do why would, with why were Jews killed? And I've capitalized Jews because they were the principal targets of the Holocaust. If you look at this chart, which lists the death rates among various groups that the Nazis targeted, the Jews who ever came within the Nazi reach, almost 80% of them were killed, two thirds of the Jews of Europe. This is much more than the rate of death among Soviet prisoners of, uh, prisoners of war, which was 58%, much more than the death rate among the handicapped and mentally infirm in German uh, asylums and sanatoria, where it was perhaps 30%, much more than the killing of the Sinti and Roma, the so-called gypsies, where it was no more than a quarter, certainly much more than the killing of gay men, which mounted to less than 1% of the, of the German gay population, and much less in occupied countries and so on. The central target of the, of the Nazi onslaught was the Jews. And this is a relevant question to Americans nowadays, since the events of Charlottesville, where torch-wielding people marched through the streets saying Jews will not replace us. 
In the last few days, we've seen the, out, uh, the occurrence of pamphlets, leaflets left in six different states of the United States, alleging that Jews are behind the public health campaign to have people be vaccinated and inoculated. This is a kind of propaganda that is right out of the Nazi playbook. So here I'm posing a historical question about what happened in the past, but it is extremely important for us in the present to understand the logic, if you will, the unreasonable logic that led to allegations against the Jewish people. And then the second question I'm gonna address is why didn't anyone prevent or stop this? Why is it that this ongoing genocide, which was well publicized and well understood outside of Nazi territory, why is it that no one stepped in at a time like ours in which refugee crises are recurrent and genocides regrettably are as well, understanding the resistance of people to helping is a vitally important thing for Americans. Now, let me turn to the first, I did that, the first question, which is why were Jews killed? It's important to understand that there is a long tradition in Western civilization of hostility to Jews. It's a tradition that essentially begins with the rise of Christianity. The word anti-Semitism that we use nowadays is a new word. It was coined in roughly 1878, 1879. It's originally a German word. Um, it was coined in an attempt to give a modern gloss an almost scientific or legitimate form to an ancient hostility toward people who subscribe to the Jewish religion or who were of Jewish descent. Essentially, it was a notion that Jews are contaminating and conspiratorial. They are a threat to the dominant population, so said these people, because they are those two things. The original view of them as contaminating and conspiratorial stems from the rise of Christianity. After all, Christianity in its early stages, Jesus in his first uh, appearance and his first messaging to the world, basically what he offered was a variation, an offshoot of Judaism, a religion that was monotheistic, one God, like the Jews, but added the notion of God in three persons, the Trinity, a religion that believed in scripture, and took the Hebrew Bible as a basis for the religious texts of Christianity, but then added the gospels, the epistles, and so forth. A religion that believed in the covenant between believers and the one God. But unlike the Jewish tradition, which said the covenant is between a particular people and the Lord, in which the people accept the laws of God, and they in return become a light unto the nations, Christianity said, no, the good news is available to everybody. Everyone can become part of the covenant with the Lord if you accept the teachings of the new religion. This was the good news that Christianity proclaimed to the world. And <clears throat> the Jews were the people who said, no, thank you. They were the people who said, we already have a relationship with God, scripture, <clears throat> a belief in monotheism. We do not need the new dispensation and so forth. As we all know from real life, rejection is not always a pleasant feeling. And the dominant religion, because Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire in the fourth century of the Common Era, the dominant religion had to develop a response to this rejection. The dominant religion's response was to say that these people must survive. They must not be persecuted because they were once the God, God's chosen people. And on the day when they convert, it will be the triumph of the new religion and so forth. So they must be kept alive in order to ultimately accept the truth. However, they must suffer because they have rejected the new faith that is the true faith, the total one that all human beings should embrace. Now, the beginning of discrimination and regulations against Jews in the Western tradition stems from this. Because if Jews are dangerous, that is, they are contaminating to your belief in the true faith. And they also are conspiratorial because they do not, they plot against the new faith. They must be kept at arm's length. They must be relegated to particular places where they live. They must be confined to certain occupations, most of them dirty, tanning, or in the Christian eyes, money lending, peddling, these things. 
They must be kept at a distance, but they must be preserved. And this was the dominant attitude in Western societies, all of Europe, <clears throat> in the era in which religion was the dominant thinking structure of most people right up until the 18th century. In the 18th century, this began to break down. It broke down under the weight of ideas of, of um, the Enlightenment. All people are created equal. All people should be able to share in the fruits of their own labor. They should be able to do anything they want. They should have equal access. This was the message of the Declaration of Independence. It was the message of the French Declaration of the Rights of Man in 1792 after the storming of the Bastille. This was the new ideology of human emancipation restriction from the hierarchies of nobles and aristocrats and monarchs and so forth. It also meant the emancipation of the Jews. Jews were to be freed from all the restrictions that for centuries that had confined them, and they were to be allowed to share into all of the parts of life that everyone else did. Now, what happened here is, and this idea gradually spread across Europe. It spread very abruptly at the beginning of the 19th century because it spread with Napoleon's armies as they conquered most of Europe. But as Napo after Napoleon was defeated, there was a relapse and then a gradual return to the ideas of emancipation and equality. And across Europe, from west to east, <clears throat> in the 19th century, Jews acquired equal rights with everyone else. What this meant is that in 1800, there were no Jewish predominant heads of companies. There were no Jewish um, professors. There were no Jewish prime ministers. And by the end of the century, all of those things had happened. A people who had historically been regarded as a threat, as inferior, now were part of the society. They were almost immigrants. Though they had lived in these societies for hundreds of years, they'd been kept socially confined. They were almost immigrants to the wider society. And this produced, in the course of the 19th century, not only Jewish emancipation and great opportunities that Jews could take advantage of as they explored the new rights that they had in all of these societies, it also created a backlash. And the backlash was the result not only of the emancipation of the Jews, but of what else was happening at the same time. In the 19th century, people underwent enormous transformations of their experience that we think of now with under the simple and single label of the Industrial Revolution. People moved from farms to factories. They moved from rural areas to cities. They became part of mass political movements that had not existed before. There was an enormous transformation of European society. And when things change, we all know from our own experience in the United States in the last 60 years, when economies change, when societies change, there are winners and there are losers. There are people who benefit from the changes and there are people who suffer. On the whole, the 19th century was, despite slums and tenements and pollution and the, the things that we think of out of Dickens's novels, the 19th century was an era of people's standards of living in Europe rising. But there were people who lost out, in many cases farmers, because they had to compete with goods that were produced in Argentina or the United States, where the soil was much more fertile and the output was therefore much greater. Um, in some cases, religious figures felt that their prestige declined with the rise of Darwinism and secularization. Aristocrats found themselves threatened by democracy and the practice of democratic elections and so forth. And there were walks of life, people who had made their living by making things, who became suddenly redundant. Almost none of my students when I taught at Northwestern knew what a cooper was. We think of it only as a family name for people who can come from the British Isles, but a cooper was somebody who made barrels. This is a, this is a walk of life that employed thousands of people in 1810 and almost nobody in 1890. Shoemakers also went into decline as factories replaced them and so forth. What am I getting at? The audience for people who came along and said, your lives are getting worse because their lives are getting better. That audience existed. It was available, and anti-Semitic agitators throughout the 19th century drew this connection. They said, the improvement of the existence of Jews in our societies is the cause of why your lives have gotten worse. And these sectors of the society were the audience that was receptive to this explanation, unlike, say, industrial workers who thought that Karl Marx had the right idea. The cause of their misfortune was 
the bourgeoisie or the bosses or whatever. But there were other people who were prepared to believe, no, the cause is they're doing better. The Jews are the source of our problems. In the 19th century, this audience was big enough for anti-Semitism to be a constant element of European life. People wrote books explaining that the Jews were the source of all problems and so on. They kept the tradition of Jew hatred alive. They sold, in many cases, a lot of books. They were politically negligible. Anti-Semitic political parties never won a major election in a European country in the 19th century. They influenced the dictatorial policies of the Tsarist Empire. But otherwise, they were a marginal political force right up until 1912. In Germany, where the term anti-Semitism comes from and where anti-Semitic political parties were organized throughout the period of the German Empire from 1871 to 1918, they never won more than 5% of the vote in an election. Flash forward to 1933, where Adolf Hitler is running for office with a central promise that he would remove the Jews, that this would be the source of Germany's recovery to get rid of them and he got 37% of the vote. How do you get from a political movement which in 1912 is marginal and negligible to a political movement that in 1933 becomes the leaders of Germany? The key intervening events are the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917, which gave these anti-Semitic agitators a new argument. Communism is the work of the Jews. Communism is threatening to you. They will take away your livelihoods and your property. They are inspired by the Jews, because after all, Karl Marx was the son of a Jewish um, father. Um, and they are going, to, and they are the driving force behind the leftist movements in Europe. In the 1920s, the audience for this in Germany was particularly large because Germans suffered from the humiliation of defeat at the end of World War I a defeat that had very hard material consequences in the form of an enormous fine called reparations that they had to pay, in the form of an inflation of their currency, which meant that in 1923, the German mark, which had been worth four to the dollar in 1913, was worth in 1923, I'm not making this up, listen carefully, 4.2 trillion to the dollar. It was literally not worth the paper it was written on. And in large parts of Germany in 1923, people were buying goods and so forth with US dollars. In 1929 came the stock market crash. It hit in Germany harder than any other country in the world. The German unemployment rate was higher than in any other country in the world. And in this environment, Adolf Hitler came to the German people and said, I know what's wrong here. I know what is the source of all of this and I alone can fix it. And what I can do is I can remove the Jews and I can rearm this country so that we are equal to everybody else again in the world and we will count for something and you will be proud again. Vote for me. He didn't get a majority of the vote. He peaked at 37%, but it was enough to make him the person in a parliamentary system where the votes were fragmented that the president picked to form the government. And in Janu on January 30th, 1933, he became the head of Germany. He had risen to power on a German sense of victimization. And from the fact that all of that agitation in the 19th century meant that it wasn't that all Germans were anti-Semites, but very few Germans were anti-anti-Semites. Very few Germans thought that a political party that says this group of people must be removed, they are the source of all problems, very few people thought that was disqualifying nonsense. And because of that, Hitler becomes chancellor, the ruler of the country in January 1933. And within six months, he turned the nation into a dictatorship by a mixture of police action and intimidation and popular enthusiasm. Now, what this meant was that a very powerful country was now in the grip of a particular ideology. Nazism taught a kind of jungle morality. All life is inevitable struggle. We are all engaged in a dog-eat-dog -dog battle every day for what he called our daily bread. That dog-eat-dog -dog battle applies to nations as well as people. It is a perpetual struggle and only an idiot pulls his punches. There are no holds barred. Only we matter. Everything is life or death. 
Now, this is obviously an ideology that taught Germans to forget the Sermon on the Mount, to forget the Ten Commandments, to forget any of those things. Everything is about winning. It's about winning now. And principles and morals and so forth, those are all for the lily-livered livered people among us. This ideology becomes the dominant ideology of the whole country through a mixture of intimidation, indoctrination, and intoxication. Intimidation, <clears throat> the Nazis made clear to Germans that we have concentration camps. They were well publicized. You can end up there if you cross us. If you march, if a group of stormtroopers marched down the street of a German city carrying Nazi swastika flags and you were standing on the sidewalk and you did not raise your arm in the Nazi salute, then some of those stormtroopers would fall out and beat you up and the police would do nothing about it. That was the kind of thing that could happen to you when this dictatorial ideology came in power. Indoctrination, they reached out to everybody. They, had, they didn't have TV, but they had radio and they had all of the newspapers. There were no foreign publications allowed to be available in Germany. Everything was in an echo chamber. And, the, and even people who wanted to become lawyers or school teachers had to go to boot camp before they could take their licensing exams so that they were thoroughly ingrained in Nazi ideology, which emphasized hatred of Jews. And so it became second nature to people, a reflex to repeat this stuff as a part of advancing in the world. And as they repeated it more and more, they were infected by it. And finally, intoxication. The Nazis carried out the fastest recovery from the depression in the world. They did it by a massive program of government spending for infrastructure and for new factories to create substitutes for imports that they couldn't afford and for armaments. And it was a system that revived industrial employment very fast. It did not revive living standards. Most of the gains went into producing more arms and so forth, but people had jobs again and people felt more secure. And what's more, Hitler won various foreign policy successes. He was able to remilitarize parts of German territory that the Allies had prevented soldiers from being stationed in. He took over Austria. He took over parts of, the, of Czechoslovakia. And with each of these victories, all of them bloodless, with each of these victories, Germans felt they were more and more important in the world. The phrase was, wir sind wieder wer. We're somebody again. And Germans had a great sense of national belonging, but who was outside of the group to which they belonged? The Jews, the people who were supposedly the mortal threat. And this created a murderous society, which was prepared to do terrible things. I've written some books about German corporations and their involvement with the Nazi state. And one of the most dramatic facts about the two, book, two companies on which I focus is that in 1933, there was not a single member of their boards of directors who was a Nazi. And in 1943, virtually all of them were. And what's more, they were up to their armpits in the Holocaust. These are companies that came into, in 1933, thought Hitler would, was likely to be bad for the German economy. And in 1943, they were co-makers of Zyklon, the gas that was used to kill people at Auschwitz. They were both producing massive quantities of goods for the war effort. They were both engaged in using slave labor. How do you get a society that goes in 10 years from this kind of mistrust to this kind of affirmation? You do it by this development of intimidation, indoctrination, and intoxication. Now, why then did the Nazis want to kill? They, after all, they told Germans they were going to remove the Jews. That meant drive them out of the country. Well, there was a problem. You couldn't drive them out as fast as the Nazis wanted to because other countries wouldn't open their borders. And the regime began expanding its own borders in such a way that every time they expanded, they acquired more Jews. So by 1938, the Nazi government began to realize that it was chasing its own tail. It could not drive Jews out of Germany fast enough because more Jews were coming in through the annexation of Austria or the Sudetenland in Czechoslovakia. And then in 1939, what is today's Czech Republic became part of Germany. They realized there was a contradiction between two central ideas of Nazi ideology, removal of the Jews, getting rid of them, and acquiring living space, territory into which Germany could expand. 
In November 1938, a new word begins to appear in the vocabulary of Nazi leaders, one that they have not used before about the Jews. They begin to refer, refer not to removal, Entfernung in German, but to annihilation, Vernichtung in German. It shows up in a variety of places in November, and then in January 1939, Hitler made a speech to the Reichstag, the German parliament, saying, if war breaks out in Europe again, it will not mean the defeat of Germany, it will mean the end of the Jewish race in Europe. From 1939 to 1941, the Nazis basically go from a position of having a motive to want to kill these people. They claim they are uniquely contaminating, conspiratorial, and against Germany. Therefore, the Nazis claim we're acting in self-defense. They are the people behind everything wrong in the world, and they hate us, and we must therefore get rid of them. They move from that to opportunity because the war breaks out in 1939. They invade Poland. They conquer Poland. They invade France in 1940. They conquer France and the Low Countries in 1940. They begin planning to invade the Soviet Union in 1941. And with each of these expansions, they the under cover of war, they have acquired more Jews and they think they can get away with beginning to reduce that number through a different means of removal, not expulsion, but in this case, extermination. And then in 1941, they realize that they already have the means because in 1939, they had resolved to thin out the population of German hospitals and asylums and sanatoria by killing all the inhabitants who were regarded as incurable. Hitler's idea was he would free up beds for wounded soldiers and so forth. And they had begun doing this in 1939, between 1939 and uh, actually the, the gassing begins in 1940, the decisions in 1939. By the summer of 1941, they had killed about a little over 70,000 people from these institutions. But they had realized that they had the technology. They could kill these people as they had done with carbon monoxide pumped out of bottles. It was prepared in a chemical lab pumped out of bottles into closed rooms where these people would die. They, in the summer of 1941, Hitler transferred the personnel who had done this in the German mental institutions to the Eastern Front, just after the invasion of the Soviet Union, where they were then positioned to be able to extend the process. The leaders of Nazi Germany then concluded, roughly in September and October of 1941, that there was no reason to wait about removing the people who were supposedly such a threat, particularly now that German armies had expanded across Eastern Europe and acquired a massive population of them. And the shootings begin in the summer of 1941. 500,000 Jews are shot during that year as the German armies advance. It, it, it totals to about a million and a half by the middle of the next year. And the stage is set for the gassings to begin. Now, once they did, and they, as I said, December 8th, the day after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor is the first ga mass gassing at a little town, little place called Helmno. I'll show you a picture in a minute. Once it happened, once it started, the shootings were already known in the United States before the attack on Pearl Harbor, before the gassings began. They were publicized in American newspapers, not on the front page to be sure, but they were publicized in the interior parts of papers. Um, the gassing was known in the West beginning it, almost as soon as it started on a massive scale in March of 1942. The problem was that any of the groups that might have put up a resistance to this, just as any of the groups, as I'll say in a minute, who might have done something before the gassing even began, they always had something else to do. Now, let me, let me take a look at the three, at the groups that would have been the most important in this. First, the Jews themselves. Why couldn't they prevent or stop this? Well, everywhere there were too few. Remember in Germany, when Hitler started the crackdown, they were less than 1% of the German population. The biggest share of a population in Europe that they had was in Poland, which was 10%. In Lithuania, it was 7.5%, and roughly that in the occupied Soviet Union and so forth. They were not only too few, they were too divided, Jews were split when at this period in European history between people who were religious and secular. If they were religious, they were often split between um, Orthodox Jews or even ecstatic um, Hasid groups 
or more middle-class groups who were neologue or what we today calling the United States Reform Judaism. They were divided whether they were Zionists who saw a future for Jews in a Jewish state in Palestine or whether they were people who said, no, the future of the Jewish people is here in these countries where we and so forth. They were faced when the Nazis came with two decisions they had to make very fast. What are they going to do with us? And what is the most effective response? Those were difficult questions to answer because the Nazis themselves didn't know exactly what they were going to do with the Jews when they arrived in many of the countries of Europe. And certainly even in the summer of 1941, they didn't know yet what they were going to do with the Jews of Poland, even though they had already started shooting the Jews in the Soviet Union. And then what's the most effective response? To arrive at an agreement on this, people had to know each other, trust each other, like each other, have experience with each other, but they had worked in their separate communities, their separate political groups. They were affiliated with separate hospitals and separate schools. All of this had to be overcome. It was very, very difficult. And they were too alone. Now here, I, what I want you to know, notice is this. This is a map of Europe. I put a spot in the center in Vienna. The bulk of the Jewish population of Europe was here. This is the old historic pale of settlement in what used to be the Russian Empire before 1914. This is where the great bulk of the killing occurred. Uh, this was also an area that was caught between the Nazis on this side and the communists on this side. And Jews tended to be alone in these areas because when the Nazis, when they marched in, with the exception of Poland, but certainly in Lithuania and Latvia, Estonia, Ukraine, the Nazis seemed to be the, a force that would bring these nations national independence again, as in the case of the Baltic states, or for the first time in the case of Ukraine. Nationalists tended to rally to the German side. They tended to describe Jews as pro-Soviet, because after all, when the Soviets had occupied some of these areas, including this part of Poland in 1940, they had wiped away all kinds of restrictions on Jews that the old independent government had imposed. The Soviet Union looked like an agent of enlightenment to the Jews. The Nazis looked like an agent of freedom to the majority populations. And what this meant was Jews were caught in the crossfire between nationalism and communism. And it meant they were alone. They were often faced not just with the marauding Russian, uh, marauding German shooting units and roundup groups and, and so forth. There was a high incidence of collaboration in murder in Ukraine and Lithuania and Latvia and Estonia. And in Poland, it wasn't so much collaboration as attempting to keep oneself alive. The Nazis made clear that if you hid a Jew and you were caught doing that, your whole family would be killed. Uh, and so there were villages that, in fact, organized Jew hunts in order to make sure that there's nobody hiding in our area. There's nobody, no Jew who is safe in our area for fear that the Nazis would exercise reprisals. Now, the other reason why this whole thing became very difficult to stop was that the Nazis developed a fast and cheap killing process, which was out of the Allies' reach. And the bulk of the killing occurred while Germany was winning the war. Now, this is three things I want you to notice. Fast and cheap killing process. This is Hamno. This is the ruins of the place where uh, somewhere between 160 and 225,000 Jews were killed. It was nothing but an old manor house built by a Russian nobleman at the end of the 19th century divided up into apartments while Poland was independent between the wars. When the Germans came in, they expelled all these people who lived here. They turned the house into a gathering center for Jews from the region where it was located, which was here on this map. They deported those people by trucks to this site. They enclosed the site with a fence that's no longer there. This is a picture of probably about 10 years ago. This is the fence was put here of wood. There was a fence of wood over here. There was a gate and some wood in over here. And then this side is a river. So there was a wire fence. Notice how cheap that is. The building is already there. They brought the Jews in trucks. They made them get out here. They made them go down into the basement of the building here. As they passed through here, all of their remaining possessions were taken away 
and were put in these rooms. And then they were made to walk up a ramp here. When they got outside, they were on top of a, uh, a platform above these rocks. The platform led into the back of trucks that looked like moving vans. The exhaust pipes of those trucks were hooked up into the back. The doors were closed. The people were asphyxiated by the carbon monoxide from the motor engines of the trucks. They either idled there or they drove off into a forest and people died in the process. The bodies were then unloaded and burned in the open air. Notice how low tech this is. The Germans had to do almost nothing except bring the trucks, which the SS already had, put up some wood and wire and carry out the process. This is Belchich. This is the site that you're looking at an aerial view of the death camp that was erected in 1941. It operated only during that year. It was closed by the end of 1941. About 600,000 people were killed here. This is the length of three football fields. This is two. They were brought in on trains right here. They were made to get out right here. The gas chambers were right there at the time. They were pushed into the gas chambers, they were gassed, and their bodies were burned in pits that are these dark spots along here in the memorial now. That's where they were gotten rid of. Look how low tech this is. The original gas chamber here was built out of two rows of wood with a layer of sand in between and some tar paper outside on the roof and the walls and some flashing around the floor inside. It was very easy to construct. It cost almost nothing. It was easy to take down later. And thus they constructed a process that was fast and cheap. In all of these cases, they used carbon monoxide. It was generated not as at Shumno by trucks, but at Belchech and Zobibor and Treblinka, it was generated from captured Russian tank engines. The Germans didn't even have to buy the motors. All they had to supply was the gasoline. And you, they killed 600,000 people here, up to 225,000 here, about 9,000 at Treblinka. This is, now Treblinka was here, about 200,000 at Sobibor here, 600,000 at Belchech here, Shelmno about around 200, 225,000. At this camp, Auschwitz, right here, the gas was different. The gas was called Zyklon. It was a fumigant that the SS used routinely to kill lice and so forth in their barracks. They already had a supply line for it. They just decided it was easier to use that to kill human beings. They didn't have to, they could build um, gas chambers that looked like shower rooms, but they wouldn't have to pipe in any water. They wouldn't have to do any expensive piping. The shower heads were all uh, dummies and they, they are killed a million people. Now, this process is not only fast and cheap, it's also quick. Notice the intensity of the murder. Four million people, two thirds of the victims of the Holocaust were killed in only this short period from the invasion of the Soviet Union at the end of June, 1941, until the Russian defeated Stalingrad at the end of January, 1943. The vast majority of the killing took place in only 19 months, over half the total victims died in only 11 months from March of 1942 to the end of January 1943, and one quarter died in only 14 weeks between late July and early November 1942. All of this was happening while the Germans were winning the war. The defeat at Stalingrad, which is way over here, occurred at the end of January 1943. Up until that moment, we had not yet invaded Italy from the south. We had driven the Nazis out of North Africa. Uh, until that moment, the location of Allied aircraft was here. You could not get an Allied plane from here to even Chelmno or Auschwitz on a single tank of gas and have it get home safely during the entire Second World War. Chelmno was no longer operating. Um, in 1943 and 1944. It had been closed in 1942. The only camp still operating in 1944 when the United States became capable of hitting Auschwitz um, was Auschwitz. All the rest of them had been closed by the end of 1943 and Belchech, as I said, by the end of 1941. We became capable of bombing it because we invaded Italy and we got up to here, a place called Foggia, which was an old Italian airbase, and we could fly from here to Auschwitz and back. <clears throat> However, you remember that I said 
everybody always had something more important to do. Not only by the time we got to hit uh, Auschwitz, not only were we, um, was Auschwitz the only camp that was still operating, it was also, <clears throat> we became capable of hitting Auschwitz when we had a great many other things to do. The mass deportation to, of the Hungarian Jews to Auschwitz, 500,000 people, took place in May and June of 1944. About three quarters of these people were massacred when they arrived at uh, Auschwitz. And people who have talked about why the United States should have bombed the camp have constantly drawn attention to this part of the mass killing. After all, most victims of the Holocaust were already dead, okay? 4.6 million were already dead. And by the time we get to May and June of um, 1944, probably um, well over 5 million were already dead. So this is the moment when it seems we could have done something. But May and June of 1944 is also the moment when the V2s are raining down on London. And they're being launched from these places along the coast of northern France, Belgium, the Netherlands. It's also the preparatory phase of the Normandy invasion, which is here. And the use of the Air Force was heavily devoted to knocking out the railroads and the bridges that supplied the German defenders here. And finally, in order to paralyze the German defense, we wanted to take out all of the German refineries for gas and fuel. And so the Air Force was devoted in the summer of 19, or early summer of 1944 and into the summer to knocking those out all over Germany. In fact, an American bombing raid went from here to Auschwitz in the summer of 1944 and bombed a synthetic fuel factory that was just east of the camp, but it did not bomb the camp. Now, I'm telling you all this because it's a kind of microcosm of the fact that everybody always had something else to do. In the United States, back in the 1930s, before the Holocaust started, but when people, when the, that ship was coming up to the coast of America and was turned back to St. Louis, when Jews were trying desperately to get out of Germany, when as many Jews were trying to get out of Poland, even then before the German invasion, the United States was relatively inhospitable. We restricted the number of German, who, Germans who could come into America every year to about 23,000 people. We had a quota system on every country. There were only 6,000 Poles a year who could get into the United States. And we kept those restrictions on because immigration was regarded as dangerous. The depression was still on in America in 1936-37 and only really beginning to fade in late 1938. And the arguments against admitting refugees will sound very familiar to you now. They'll take your jobs, they'll cost you money because some of them will become uh, on welfare cases and so forth. And then what they said in those days was not that there'll be terrorists among them, although that is said now about the United States southern border, but rather there will be spies among them because the Nazis could blackmail people who still had relatives back in the old country to work for them after they came to the United States. So these arguments were the strongest arguments that were against letting in more refugees. And in fact, the United States let the quota number of Jews, that is that small 23,000 that were allowed to come in, they, they, we filled that quota only two years, 1938 and 1939. Uh, in the aftermath of the burning of the German synagogues on the so-called Kristallnacht, we opened the doors wide and then we began to close them again. Britain did the same thing. Uh, so in all of these nations, uh, there was a sense that first, you don't condemn the Nazis in, in the 1930s because we don't interfere in the internal politics of other countries. This was a diplomatic nicety at the time. Immigration is threatening to those of us at home still trying to recover. And then interdiction, bombing, was prevented in 19, the 1940s because we had more important things to do. We weren't the only ones who had more important things to do. The Catholic Church regarded its most important mission in occupied countries and, and in Germany as delivering the sacraments to the faithful, because without the sacraments, you can't get to heaven, and you can't get the sacraments without priests. So the churches have to be made, kept open. And Pius XII, the Pope, kept pulling his punches toward the Nazis. Above all, he had other reasons, but above all, because he wanted to keep the churches open. 
The difference between Hitler and Stalin in his eyes was Stalin closes the churches, and he did. Uh, and Hitler might if I cross him. The International Red Cross, which knew about the gassings from the moment they began in 1942, their headquarters in Switzerland, Karl Burchardt, the number two man in the International Red Cross, received reports of what was happening in Poland, but he declined to pass those reports on at first because he said, and he, he certainly declined to speak out publicly again or to denounce the Nazi government because he thought the principal mission of the International Red Cross is to deliver medicines and food and so forth to prisoners of war behind the lines on all sides. And that mission cannot be endangered. Everybody always had something more important to do than help. And this is what I call a part of the optic of the Holocaust, because we look back on these years now and we think this was from the point of view of human rights, from the point of view of individual moral standing and so forth, this was the most important thing that happened then but it's not the way it looked to people at the time. To people at the time, there were a lot of other things that were more important that were happening. We didn't know on December 8th, 1941, about the gassings at Helmo. But if we had, would they have made it to the front page on the morning after Pearl Harbor? Would they have made it to page 20? In the United States, at that moment, the most important thing was we were being plunged into war. And this was true for some of these people at all times throughout the whole process. Something else was more urgent. All right, I will be happy to answer your questions. I hope I have provided a background to why Jews are a, a subject of attack so often in societies like ours, even up until these dreadful, dreadful leaflets that have been cir circulated in the last few days, and some sense of why these events unfolded in the ghastly way that they did. Thank you very much for your attention. Professor Hayes, you certainly uh, gave people a lot to think about. Do you want to stop the screen share, um, or is there more? I know, I can, I can do that. Uh, have I stopped it? Uh, not, you stopped the panelists, but not... Uh, we're still seeing your, your, there. There Perfect. we go. Good. Um, well, you're, de you're dealing with an old man, you know, these things are, these things are complicated. You know, as I say to my, to my children, we are not digital natives. Um, we are not, exactly. And, and we are, we are grateful uh, for your knowledge and for your wisdom. Um, and so let us, let us kind of look to some of the questions that one of the questions that our, our folks asked and when you talked about the corporations that you had studied um, and you said over the course of 10 years, the leaders of the corporations, no one had been a Nazi and then they were almost all Nazis. Mm -hmm. Was it the same people who became Nazis or were the corporations taken over by people who were Nazis? Half and half. Uh, it, it, of course, it varies from one company to another. Uh, in some companies, the penetration of the Nazis was greater, uh, particularly companies where Jews had been prominent uh, in the board of directors or as owners, because those people were all driven out and Nazis tended to replace them. Uh, in other companies, it wasn't so much a change of personnel as it was a, a, a turning of the coat. Uh, people just deciding that it's in our advantage to have a party label on our lapel. Um, and so they joined up. The big waves of joining came in 1937 and again in 1940-41. And one of the, thank you. Now, question several folks have asked is, when we're looking at the question of people, you know, there was always something else that people were concerned about. Um, was there a banking relationship between the United States and the Nazi government? that would cause us to not want to inter intervene? Well, there were, there were close business ties between some American firms, uh, law firms and investment firms and people in Berlin. There were a lot of American loans that had been extended to Germany in the 1920s. And when the Nazis came in, they froze repayment on those loans. So, um, and, and American creditors, worried a great deal about 
getting those loans ultimately paid. So there were economic motivations, if you will, on the part of some individuals and corporations to go easy on the Nazis, to, to the, ignore the bad things that they do. But um, the economic connection was not all that tight. Uh, the German foreign trade declined greatly in the 1930s because the Nazis concentrated on the domestic economy and they didn't want to be involved in international trade because if you're involved in international trade, that means other countries have influence over you. So I would not say that the economic connection was predominant or the most important thing here, but it was influential with some people. And tell us, was there... Was there any attempt to get the United States engaged? You know, was there a congressional debate? Was there an approach to, you know, there try were, to get folks there, involved? Yes, there were very strong attempts, uh, particularly in some of the metropolitan areas of the country, to organize rallies against the Nazis and for sympathy for German Jews and so forth. There was a huge rally in Madison Square Garden in, in very early, 1933. Um, and to uh, engage public opinion. But there was a fair amount of American anti-Semitism at that time. And the people, and, and that feeling, along with the economic uh, argument that if you let the Jews in, they'll compete for our jobs, uh, that made the congressional debates about opening up access to refugees almost always have a negative result. Um, one of the arguments that people don't notice much, but were very strong in the 1930s. Remember, the, there were other governments in Europe that were anti-Semitic and that were trying to reduce their Jewish populations. Poland and Romania were the two principal ones. They had actually asked the League of Nations for help in um, getting Jews out of their countries and settled in other places and so on. The people who argued against more refugees coming to America always said, this is not about the 500,000 German Jews. This is about the three and a half million Polish Jews and the eight, 750,000 Romanian Jews. They will flood us if we let them in. And so these arguments were very powerful antidotes, if you will, to the, ag to the agitation of Americans who sympathized with what was happening to Jews. And one of the queries, there's been many um, discussions over the years about anti-Semitism within the United States State Department at that time. Um, would you like to talk about what role did that play and how strong was that? Well, the man who was in charge of visa policy for most of this period, from 1936 to 1944, actually, was a man named Breckenridge Long who was a demonstrable anti-Semite. We have the record to prove it. He also didn't like Catholics. Um, he, he didn't like most anybody who wasn't a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. And he had control over visa policy. He was overruled by FDR on only two major occasions where the, we opened up the, the borders for a while and then they closed back down again. Um, so Breckenridge Long was an anti-Semite, was powerful in the State Department, did exert a restraining influence. One of the remarkable things, though, when you look at the American diplomats who were stationed abroad is how variable they were. There were American consuls um, in some places, uh, Vienna, Frankfurt, um, the, the vice consul in Berlin, who were quite sympathetic to what was happening to Jews and, to, and were trying very hard to help them. And then there were other consuls in other places who were not. So the State Department was not monolithic. And one of the, we, we actually have some, some young people who've joined us for this um, webinar and uh, we're getting some questions from them, which is also wonderful. And, one of them you touched on in your uh, presentation, but what question is, could the Jew, Jewish people not just flee from Germany? No, no, because you, you, had to be, you had to do two things. You had to get the permission of the Nazis to leave. And that meant, although it was a little better at the beginning in 1933, but it got progressively harder. That mean you, meant you had to leave almost everything behind. That was the first thing. And most of the people who did not leave uh, 
Remember, about about sixty percent of the German Jewish population got out. Um, most people who did not leave were older. They were over fifty, and they thought it would be harder for them to adapt to a new place. They or they were women who had caretaking responsibilities for older parents, or they were people who had relatives they felt responsible for who were in hospitals or mental institutions or care centers and so forth. The people who didn't leave were people who felt they really couldn't. But on the other hand, you had to, and they stayed, even though uh, they, they were losing everything if they stayed or if they left. Uh, but the other thing was you had to get into someplace else. And most other countries were as restrictive as we were. It was relatively easy to get out in 1933, 34, but that was before most German Jews realized how bad it would get. And then after 1935, countries that had been very open, France, the Netherlands, Czech, uh, Czechoslovakia, began to close their borders just like everyone else. And what was the population of, of Jewish people in the United States at that time? I don't know. It was about 4% of the total. I just forget. I think the total in the U.S. in the 1930s is about 130 million people. Um, so, you know, the argument that we couldn't absorb people has rather been disproven by the history I, later, hasn't it? Yes, I mean, yes. we now mm -hmm. have 330 million people here. Um, but that was the argument at the time, and it was a depression-influenced argument. Well, we could certainly, I, I will tell you, Professor, that consistently the messages are coming through that they want to listen to you for another two hours, um, but we've There's only- There's a book. <laughs> that I, I was going to say, um, and so when, when we send the uh, uh, follow-up, we will both send the follow-up that has a link to this webinar so that you can share this. It will be on our YouTube channel and a link to purchase the book. Um, and so here's the final question that several people have asked in different ways, which is here we are in 2022. Do you see, uh, do you see some of this authoritarianism coming? Do you see the anti-Semitism emerging? What are the lessons for our time from your uh, work? Well, the answer is of course. And um, the lessons of our time are not to give way to a sense of victimization. There are an awful lot of people in the United States now who seem to feel they are somehow the victims of events and therefore they're entitled to lash out. Uh, that's exactly what propelled the Nazi party, the sense that the world's been unfair to us and we are entitled to be unfair to other people. Um, I, I worry terribly about anti-Semitism, um, not only because it, it has burst in this country in the last four years in ways I never would have imagined in, in 2015 when I stopped teaching. And I worry about it above all because I think everybody must understand that th this sort of thing starts with the Jews, but it never stops with them. It, authoritarianism has a, an endless appetite. Um, and the, the Nazi attack on the Jews was as Hannah Arendt, the political philosopher, wonderful sentence said, the, the Holocaust was an attack on human diversity as such. And that's what drives this? It, and we have to be terribly afraid because the consequences are horrible for the victims. But stop and think what the consequences were for the Germans. In 1945, that country was rubble. And it was rubble because if hate-filled ideologies always will encourage the forces that rise up against them. Wow. Well... Professor Hayes, thank you so much. Um, I know that I've enjoyed uh, look, listening to you and, and doing the research prior to this. Uh, we do hope that people take advantage of buying the book. Um, the, op the opportunity will be there. And let us you know, remember the words of Eli Wiesel, who says, the opposite of love is not hate, it's indifference. And the opposite of life is not death, it's indifference. And so if there's a message for our time, it's that we cannot be indifferent to the rise of anti-Semitism, to uh, 
uh, anything that threatens the majesty of our more perfect union that includes people. And as we look at our upcoming programs, um, we move into Black History Month. And on February 17th, we're joining with Wayne State University to learn about Congressman Elijah Cummings' uh, work in congressional oversight uh, coming up on February 17th. And as I told you, we had some young people who have joined. Um, our education specialist is starting a special uh, series called Capital Kids, uh, which is a book and author talk for books that uh, authors have written about the Capitol, about Washington, D.C. and the Constitution for young people. And so on January 27th, Kitty Felvey will be talking about her book in the context of planning for State of the Union. Uh, watch for the newsletter and you can see more opportunities. We always have to do the what we call the NPR moment. Uh, we are a nonprofit supported by members and, and friends, and we thank you very much for your uh, contributions. And, and Professor Hayes, we thank you for giving us your time and your talent. Uh, you certainly have given people an amazing uh, presentation that took a very complex subject and gave us a new way to think about it. Thank you all. We look forward to seeing you next time. You will. Bye. Bye-bye.